Okay, good afternoon. Welcome to the Wednesday. It is Wednesday. Open meeting. Public works, I don't know who wants to go. Hand out. They didn't hand them out early. And Sean. John had them out early. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody gets one. This is Hog Island, so <laughs> looks really good. All right, good afternoon, Savannah Clement Public Services. Um, so I just handed out to the board um, some images of some work we've done out on Hog Island. Um, this is the second item on the agenda. I'm gonna go ahead and skip to that just to show you guys. Um, so just to refresh your memory, uh, we have devoted some time and material to improving the parking area there. Uh, we put down a lot of rock. Um, we had the excavator out there to get rid of some of the um, trash and garbage, um, even out some areas. And so it's looking pretty good. We, uh, we're pausing on plans moving forward for future improvements. Um, we're gonna work with the park board as far as funding and, and what they would like to see that area look like moving forward. But anyway, so that's a good thing to bring up and note. Uh, the other item is a Cougar restroom update. So last week we had intended to open it before spring break. Um, however, there was some uh, some issues with the building, some locks were broken, um, maybe some vandalism. So the groups went out this morning and got it ready and got it open. So it's currently open for use. Um, and then we did have, um, we put some barricade signs up to allow people traveling on the road to know that the restroom is open and ready for use. So that was a good um, positive thing we got to do today. Um, and that's the only parks updates I have, unless the board has any other questions. When does Cowieman Park open? I don't know. Um, I know that the bathroom is currently on order. So I would imagine, um, and I do believe that there's some work that needs to be done, um, not so much on the parking, but on the road to the park. It's a, a single one lane, um, kind of a gravel uh, county road. So I know that they were wanting to do improvements there as well before that opens. So I can get the board an update though next week on that timeline. Um, and just a miscellaneous item. I know we did have quite a few weeks back um, some public comment about Cook's Ferry and um, horseback riding out there and current conditions. So we did have a couple um, folks go out there, take a look. Um, we did some mapping on, you know, where people are utilizing the space compared to where we are currently doing that surface mine um, LT1 dredge sale thing we've got going on. Um, so, so far it looks pretty good out there. Uh, we couldn't note any gaping holes or like, you know, foot breakers or potholes. Um, there is some digging from the store, JL stored off from taking some spoils out of there, but it is all very sloped. Uh, it looks like cars and ATVs are able to drive out there. And so it's, there's no drop-offs. There shouldn't, shouldn't be any, um, there wasn't any glaring issues anyway. So just want to give an update on that as well. Right. Um, moving into maintenance. Um, so we had board approval, I believe last year, to do $75,000 in upgrades to the jury space waiting area. Uh, it's on the second floor. It's between Superior and District Court. It's a pretty much, the you know, there's pony walls separating jurors from the courtroom areas and the hallway. Um, and it's all just wooden seating. So uh, the board at that time did approve these upgrades and we're here today uh, to ask for an additional $25,000 to finish that project. Um, when we got bids and quotes and started the project about six to nine months ago, um, we had a lot of internal work being done by our maintenance crew. So painting, we, um, we have TVs in there now um, and prices have gone up on material and installation. Um, so I just wanted to request that from the board. Um, what we're doing, just to refresh your memory, is we're actually, we have those pony walls. We're adding glass partitions to reduce sound um, from the hallway area and people talking and utilizing both Superior and District Court. We also have added plug-ins, charging stations. Um, we've painted, we've done new flooring. 
Um, and then also we've got new seating in that area. So, and then also repaired the window because the main window looks out to the river. Um, so a lot of upgrades and improvements there, um, but it has gone, it will go over um, once we do the glass purchase and installation uh, over the $75,000. I was up there not long ago, and I didn't notice any of that. <laughs> it hasn't. So what, the only thing we've started is painting, window repair, and then the television and electrical. So we have we have not done the flooring, although it's budgeted, and we have not done the glass partition. So those are the two and the furniture, so three large remaining item, to-do items in that space. Okay, and... Uh... How much of the original 75K have we spent? Um, we haven't, uh, the only thing we purchased, I don't have the number, but I can tell you what we've, like I said, the painting and the, the televisions and the electrical. So we haven't moved forward in ordering everything to, until we make sure that we have the budget capacity to do so, to do the whole project. If we don't, we'll scale back and only, you know, do what we can do, which won't complete the whole project, but it'll be nicer nonetheless compared to what it is now. Yeah, the only reason I'm asking this, is this okay? Yeah. Yeah, is uh, because that's probably one of the least favorite places of anybody in the county, and they don't want to spend time sitting out in the, in the jury area, and I'm not sure we want to make it super comfortable anyhow. Okay. So just, just a thought. I'm not really I'm not really familiar with it, so it's a. I can't say I'm probably the bad one to think about that because I generally will use something until it's impossible to use it anymore. So you can discount me a little bit on that. There, there's the bias there. But was the purpose to separate the two, or it, primarily, uh, we have groups of people that can wait there for hours upon hours on end. There weren't any. I take that back. There weren't a, a lot of plugins. People couldn't charge their phones. Um, the seats are very, very uncomfortable. Um, and the flooring is getting worn. Um, the window needed repaired. We've done that. Um, again, new paint, just kind of a, a light facelift for that area. But really going into it, putting in those partitions is, and you know, I don't work in that building, but that would be one of my first things I would do to reduce the noise and also limit the interactions between jurors and people walking through that corridor. Savannah, on your list of repairs, I didn't hear you mention the the uh, uh, the drinking fountain. Oh, no, that wasn't on my radar. I didn't know that. Interesting. In, in fact, when I was on jury duty and waiting, <laughs> the bailiff said, if you wanted to drink a water, there's a there's a commissioner in your group. Let him know. <laughs> so, Good to know. I, I didn't know that. Honestly, it wasn't even on my list. But yeah, that would be something we want to fix. Maybe something similar to like. Well, it could very well here. be part of that entire building's um, plumbing Upgrades, system. It's yeah. pretty clogged. Well, I can I can definitely look into it and ask what's going on there. She gets on long to utility, so that's the silica water. Yeah. So everything that was approved before is what we're talking about. You've just, you've seen a rise in, in costs? Yes, but I wouldn't say that the entire amount, the $25,000 increase that we're asking for would account just for increased costs. Initially, we were looking to put in partitions that were a cheaper uh, plexiglass, um, which then we got bids for glass and we were able to see what the glass one looks like and the amount of noise that they can reduce, which was the intent. Um, so that did change the scope and increase the price. But as I mentioned, if that wasn't part of, if we couldn't do that and we needed to stay within, we would remove that off and it would just be uh, a lesser soundproof barrier, lesser cost, uh, just not as good of a quality. Uh, the looks of plexiglass compared to a frosted glass. Or, so again, it goes back down to the look of it. Uh, I, I didn't catch the amount that you're asking for as an increase of twenty five thousand. It's actually less than that. It's about ninety four thousand. But um, we thought we would ask for the twenty five. If the prices are less than that, then That's enough. Yeah. Yeah. So, 
And uh, you, do you lose any capacity uh, for the for the public in there? Well, I believe we'll actually increase capacity because the seating is going to change. So as opposed to the long, you know, 10 foot benches, which people don't like to sit next to each other on and they separate, we're having more like airline style seating. So it's affixed to the ground, but it's actual individual seats that are connected with plugins. So they can sleep there then. Well, I'm hoping they don't. Nobody sleeps there, um, I, but we should You're be playing seating every time you go to the oh, airport. People are <laughs> they sleep on the floor. Waiting for the next. Um, but we hope to increase the amount of seating in that area as well by putting seats in as opposed to benches. Yeah, well, you know, when you say airline seating, that does not invoke any good thoughts or or comfort. But yeah. that's kind of going back to what you said. <laughs> Better than wooden slats. I would say so. We did try out different types of the plastic seating and picked one that we thought would be, you know, okay. Yeah, I'm okay with that. Yeah. Okay, okay, thank you. You should be able to see some things improving then um, in that area here in the near future. Okay, uh, next we have uh, Sean Rowley, finance manager. Um, he's going to go over the surplus items list that you have in front of you. So, so you divide the work up, you ask for more money, and he says what we can So we're balancing things out a little bit, just different funds. Um, go ahead. You think we'll get 25000 out of this? <laughs> Maybe. <I'm teasing. laughs> but the ER&R e &R can't be spent on the courthouse. <laughs> That's, yeah, That's very correct. correct. <laughs> um, so today, uh, <laughs> I have a list here of a bunch of different vehicles from a bunch of different departments and just want to talk through them with you. Uh, this will be on the agenda for Tuesday morning. I believe it's at 930 is the public hearing. Um, and we do have numbers on the left hand side. So if there's one you want to specifically talk about, please call out. Well, on the reuse column, you have about a half a dozen that say yes to reuse so that they're not on the list. So we'll surplus them from motor pool and they may be going to a different department's motor pool. They may be going to an ER and R function, possibly so be used elsewhere. Elsewhere in the county, and you know, highlighting the very last one, this number thirty-seven, uh, seven six six three one R. This is the third life of that vehicle. It was a sheriff's office vehicle. It was a corrections office vehicle. It made its way into building and planning. And at this point in time, we're asking to surplus and remove it entirely just from the age and the mileage on it. Um, on, on something like that particular one, does it cost us or do we get a dollar or something? Yeah. So depending if it leaves the motor pool fund, there's some accounting that we have to do for it, but we're not actually transferring dollars. Now, if it's an asset such as number three, the D6 out of solid. I, I, I still got to go back to the question I asked. Oh, okay. Do we get a dollar for this or do we have to do it? Do we have to pay to remove it? Oh, when we sell it? You're right. Yeah, so we will receive it an auction. We send it off to auction, and then we do receive monies back on it. And as long as you tease me at the start, let me tease you back now. When I saw the reuse column, I look at the thing saying no dash sell. That tells me, no, we're not going to sell it. Um, no, uh, comma sell tells me that you're going to sell it. Um, so just next start, time you tease me. <laughs> <laughs> Starting at the top, um, we have a Craftco button machine. These this is a piece of equipment that puts the round buttons on the ground. On the roads. Um, unfortunately or fortunately, every year we do plow the roads. So we scrape those buttons off the road. So we no longer use that machine, have it for some years. So we'd like to surplus and sell it or trade in on a new piece of equipment, possibly. I'm glad you explained that because I was envisioning the little buttons that people mm -hmm. wear and I didn't understand why that would be in the mortar pool. And then um, number next one down, we have a Cat D6. This was an older um, cat that came out of the landfill. It was retired from use in 2020. We have held on to it to this point in time. Um, in 2020, when it was retired from landfill use, uh, it did have some significant cooling systems with it. 
they did try replacing the radiator and some other items, but it sounds like it'll need a full uh, cooling system replacement on there. Um, so at that point, we'd recommend selling that as well. Was this from the tenant way or was this some of the warehouser stock that we... So this went from tenant way and then made a move up to headquarters. Uh, next up is a Volvo uh, excavator, the EW160B. This was a, or this is a uh, tired excavator. So it has four wheels on it. Um, and so it has been replaced in the road function. We do think that there's other uses for it within the county, specifically at the landfill itself. Doesn't doesn't that go in the commissioner's playroom? You're welcome yeah. to company time. Yeah. <laughs> uh, getting into the ERNR vehicles now, uh, we have approximately six vehicles. Two, oh, excuse me, one Ford F550. Um, one Dodge 5500 that has a service body on it. Uh, and then four Chevy Silverados of differing age, all at fairly high miles. Uh, there are a few of them that say yes in our reuse column, specifically because these older high mile vehicles that still run effectively, we can use those as vehicle transports for personnel at the landfill. And when it dies, you just push it into the fill. I do want to compliment you on that. That's it's good to see that there's higher mileage there. But on the F five fifty, what's the what's the what's the problem with that one? That's a, a vehicle we just don't have a use for anymore. The the button machine was attached to that vehicle. I see. Um, and it's not one that would be needed to be maintained. So uh, what kind of dollars do you think that will bring? So that one in particular, that F550, is a single cab flatbed truck. That's a, a diesel, in my, is my understanding. Um, I don't know what somebody would be willing to pay on that in this market. Um, two years ago, possibly, it might have been higher as the new car market wasn't as attractive. Uh, I still think we'd probably get between six to twelve thousand dollars on that, being the low mileage on it, and it being a a, a diesel vehicle. Did you say high mileage? No, it only has eighty five thousand miles. It should be nothing, stuff, yeah. right? Yeah. the The reason I'm I'm asking some of this is it's always bothered me that we go through a, uh, I imagine you're going to get this over to an auction house. Mm -hmm. And uh, it seems like if their business is mm -hmm. in the county that would be able to buy it without having to go through a third party, if you will, we would, it's, it's the people's tax dollars in Cowlitz to start with. I, 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 I would hope we could figure out how we could make that available to our public here. I know that's a big pain for you and that, that may be probably one of the biggest things. Uh, I don't know if there's a concept of just letting it go as is. Like for example, all of these, you, you'd uh, tr try to advertise them and just say on this day, if you wanna come and buy this as is, do it, otherwise, we proceed like we did before. So we've historically used the auction method because we're supposed to be getting the best and highest value for the vehicles. Um, there is the option we could look into that in the future if you'd like. Um, I don't know if policy, if our current policies allow for it, but we can do whatever you guys like on that. I do um, also know just some some historical context. So it must have been probably 15 years ago the county did do an auction. Um, and I think at that time, and I could be wrong, um, but it had to be managed by RCW or statute or something by the treasurer's office. So the treasurer's office was responsible for doing this auction and actually took place at the event center. Um, but all departments could participate. Um, and they haven't done it again since. Um, but that's not to say that it couldn't happen. It just, I think it was a lot of uh, back and work accounting um, and that could be why we, they haven't done it again, but I think that was the process. So I, I would 
think that that would have to go through them as well if we don't use a third party. If, if uh, my memory serves me correct, we did that analysis and realized when you add all the staff time to organize and manage and, and do all that paperwork, our gain was much better going through an auction house where we aren't using a lot of staff time. So I know that was part of the discussion, but okay. you're right. It was you know probably in the early teens. Mm -hmm. That doesn't surprise me, but do you have an idea, a recollection of the magnitude? Because uh, we, we, we do hear payback kind of say, you know, pay back to public. This would mm -hmm. be... Yeah. If it if it were close, sort of neutral, uh, I might be a different answer. Um, and again, it's it's kind of foggy. I mm -hmm. think that was when Ron Junker was uh, filling in um, mm -hmm. at one of the one of the departments that he worked at. And well, it could. I mean, um, we could try. I'm just throwing this out there. I don't. I don't know um, what laws and statutes guide this, but um, you could just do it at a smaller scale and just do equipment, you know, vehicles. So that that scale was much larger. It was countywide. Um, we probably need to get the treasurer's input. Correct. Go yeah. Too so further. again, I don't know the ins and outs, but she hasn't been knocking on the door asking for things to do like that. No. <laughs> so just putting that out there. Yeah, it wouldn't hurt my feelings if it turns out it's just not practical, but you could always ask it and look yeah. into that. Yeah. When, no problem. When, it, when we you know, when we do that that hearing, if the if a public is listening and they say, Do they know when and they say, Man, I'd have an interest in that, do they know when it's going to the auction? So actually this week I've had a few individuals reach mm -hmm. out to us already. Mm -hmm. Um and I had some good phone conversations. Um did I kept their names and numbers and I told them I'd reach back out to them when we selected which auction house to send to and the date of that auction. So they'd have an opportunity to go down and, and it, look. if there's an item at auction that goes for ten thousand, how much do we get? So the auction house keeps a percentage of that. I'm not much? a percentage, percentage point. If it's, I believe it's over ten thousand dollars, it's a five percent fee, and if it's under ten, I think it's an eight percent fee. But I can't remember exactly off the top of my head. Most auctions are in the twenty percent. I thought we usually only use two services, and, I, and it's Jay Stout and then Ritchie Brothers. So we send a lot of the heavier equipment and stuff like that to Ritchie Brothers. Some of the personal passenger vehicles we send to Jay Stout just because that's more of their specialties. Mm -hmm. um, but I believe they're on state contracts yeah. and that's why we potentially get that lower rate than like no in other and entities if we're looking at maybe a material item such as you know worn out tires or some other item those ones are a higher uh, commission rate on that for the smaller value items yeah i mean i i take a look at something here like the f550 i think there's value there mm -hmm. the chevrolet silverado i'm scratching my head thinking probably not so they're almost doing us a favor Especially when it's on a percent commission, we're not paying a lot for that yeah. low value right. vehicle, right? And 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 we have to take into account the whole analysis. So, I understand. Um, moving down the list into juvenile, some of their old vehicles here. Uh, we have got a nineteen ninety four Super Club wagon. Um, it only has thirty six and a half thousand miles. Thirty six. 1,500 miles or so. Um, but these are the ones that sit idling on the side of the road, the work crew vans. And so the mileage doesn't look very high, but the hours on that should be significantly higher than what we'd expect. Um, and that uh, was replaced, I believe, two years ago. Um, also, we have a 2001 Crown Vic, um, another one that's lived multiple lives throughout the county. Um, moving on to facilities, we have another super club wagon. Uh, of 1996, 126,000 miles on it. It's in very bad condition, so we'd like to probably send that one off to auction. So as well. on, on any of these vehicles, like the one you just mentioned, I should be able to ask you to take me to it right now, and I should find it in a lot someplace. Yes, sir. And that's true of everything here. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. So all the cars on this list, except for one, are going to be at er &R Central Shop right mm -hmm. now. Uh, moving down the list, we have another uh, Crown Vic that come out of the assessor's office. Once again, another vehicle has lived multiple lives throughout the county. Um, 
we did replace that with a surplus uh, sheriff cars already, one of the Ford Interceptors. Um, so they were happy to get that old vehicle out and put something newer in, not brand new, but newer. Um, we have an older Ford Expedition from the jail. Uh, that vehicle's had multiple lives throughout the county as well. Um, and then we're into the sheriff vehicles here. Quite a few of them are either uh, that have been totaled, have collision damage, and those would be the ones we'd look to not reuse. Send those out for a uh, scrap value or an auction if it has good parts that could still be used. Um, some of the ones that have, say, high mileage on the Ford Interceptors, about the 138,000 miles, or excuse me, 132,000 miles, those are some high compression turboed engines. We don't want to keep those around too much longer as we don't find a lot of value left in those. So that's kind of the list. Just wanted to talk it through with you, get some good information out there and see if you had any questions on any other specific vehicles. As long as we have you here and we're on vehicles, how have the new hybrids been turning out the sheriff has chose not to order those anymore okay it and it's fairly yeah so as we've talked about um earlier this year we had one of them actually the first one here mm -hmm. line number 22 that was a 2020 hybrid interceptor and we've, we've stepped away from the ford interceptor types going more with either a tahoe or an f-150 version because those are a unibody car, repairing those is always difficult and expensive. Um, from the hybrid stance, I haven't noticed a significant difference uh, in use cases. We have had more warranty issues with those. Um, once the warranties expired after eight years on the electrical systems, I wouldn't recommend keeping those around. One of the reasons I was interested in the hybrid is because uh, very often what you described on the low mileage but a lot of hours, uh, it's a lot easier if it's a just run off the battery. And I I don't really care for them idling like that they do. It just seems to me like when was the last time you tried to start your vehicle and it didn't start? It was like never and yet that's the argument i hear used and we'll sit the, the vehicle sit there three hours idling makes no sense at all well the hybrid kind of mm -hmm. but i understand if you uh, i guess because of the battery storage compartment that's why it's a mm -hmm. it's a unibody actually all, all of the ford interceptors including line um 31 uh, 26. It's a 2016 Ford Interceptor that we also totaled out from collision damage. Oh, it was. It's the, the style of the vehicles, all unibodies, and it's just difficult to repair. Did we did we learn anything from that? That that is to say, we should have known that before we bought Interceptors. Yes, we should have known that. Okay, so. So it doesn't mean that we're not interested in hybrids. Right. We're Correct. just not interested in interceptors. Correct. That body style. Yes, it's, it's specifically the type of body style. If the Tahoe or the F-150 might offer a hybrid option in the future, we may explore those. Uh, too, I think the function and use of what these vehicles are used for in the sheriff's office, we do see a considerable um, increase in collision damage than, of course, any other department that we work in. So the interceptor may have worked really well in something, you know, like the assessor's office or building and planning. Right. It's just, it wasn't a good fit with that department. How many interceptors do we have? Is there appetite to switch? No, what? No, it, 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 to outfit them up for the sheriff is just a huge task. Yes. <laughs> Ignore that. The jury will disregard that. <laughs> that was when you were supposed to push the button. <laughs> Recording has stopped. Uh, and then I have one additional small item I was hoping to chat with real quick. Outside of the surplus, um, 
the sheriff's office has the sheriff reserves unit. Uh, they were looking to transfer one of their vehicles from the sheriff reserves to the search and rescue. It's a 2011 expedition. Um, it's not on our list here. It's still mm -hmm. a current vehicle. Um, the county still maintains the title, and that's why we need the blessing of the board to do that. And so I'm just asking if that's okay. And is that because search and rescue isn't technically a Cowlitz County entity? Correct. And so would it be a, uh, just a transfer of title? The county maintains the title on those due to insurance reasons. Oh, okay. Yeah. We just allow them to use it versus the sheriff using it? Yeah. So okay. it's currently in the, the sheriff's reserve unit. Uh, I think we see them at the fairgrounds and stuff pretty often. Mm -hmm. This would be the third or fourth vehicle that the reserves have, or so, is it would, or is it replacing the one that they have? It would be going from the reserves to search and rescue. Right. I mean, yeah. I mean, does, is that the only vehicle search and rescue has? We've done it before. I mean, that we have. Yeah, that's been a, a long going tradition to help them out. Mm -hmm. And it's just the one vehicles. Just the one vehicles, what they're asking for, yeah. And then we do the maintenance and everything for search and rescue. So we do do the maintenance on the vehicles that is billed to the sheriff's office as they don't. The vehicles in the sheriff's reserve and the search and rescue are not part of the motor pool. Mm -hmm. So we really don't handle the vehicle any different. It's just somebody different is using it. A non-county employee usually, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm okay with that. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. And let me repeat, thank you for the line numbers. You see how useful it was? He listened. <laughs> Next time they'll say, <laughs> no, call myself. No, call myself. <laughs> so we have Susan Eugenis, a county engineer, come up. She's going to give an update on an Army Corps of Engineer meeting that she attended um, yesterday afternoon. You brought reserves today? <laughs> I, I, I don't see any line numbers here. <laughs> no, I did not bring any line numbers. I just wanted to give you a high overview of the information the Corps provided yesterday and then uh, direction of if you wanted other uh, information or the Corps to come have this discussion with you. So what I hand it to you is uh, one slide from their presentation. Uh, so it's the good news, bad news. I'll give you the good news first. Everybody still has authorized level of protection. Uh, level of protection is a probability of the frequency of recurrence of a flood. Um, I mean, they used to always call it the level of protection for the 100-year storm. Now they're moving more to the probability. Uh, every levy was... Uh, Level of protection was established in 1985 for what protection they had at that time. So it varies on the levy. So Castle Rock, for example, has a 118 year level of protection, which is a eight tenths of a percent chance of uh, it being overtopped in a year. Uh, Lexington and Longview levy. So CDID-1 and Lexington Flood Control Zone District have a 167-year level of protection, which is a six-tenths of a percent chance of reoccurrence. And Kelso, so CDID-3 and Drainage Improvement District 1 have an approved level of protection of 143. Uh, the chart that I handed out shows uh, from 2016 through 2023, where the level of protections were, the dashed lines are the authorized level of protections. So the good news is everybody still has a level of protection as approved. The bad news is both Lexington and Castle Rock has seen a decrease in their level of protection. Um, it still meets the requirements, so Lexington is still, and Castle Rock are still within their range other high rain uh, level items where the SRS raise is still on schedule for the, well, it has been moved to 2025. Uh, they anticipate when that raise occurs that it'll help 
wash out, scour out some of the deposition uh, in the river. Uh, last year, our precipitation, so they do it by our rain year, our water year. So it's October through the end of September. So that, that's how they base it. And the 20 year, the last year was below the 20 year median average as was the annual river flow. So they feel it did not flush out some of that. In general, our cross sections have not changed. Uh, overall, there has been channel migration up and down the river, which is what people are saying. Well, there's uh, bars where we've never seen them and there's channel erosion in new places, which is a true statement, uh, but the overall capacity has not necessarily changed. Down here in the Longview Kelso area, the uh, river channel has drifted from one side of the river to the other, and then there's those locations up between Castle Rock and Lexington where we are seeing bank erosion as the river channel is moving one direction versus another. So they also have uh, released that's available publicly a uh, analysis for the water years from 2013 to 2022. I will tell you, I have not read every word of this. I did read the executive summary. Um, I have not had time to read the whole thing. Uh, they, the conclusion is that the river channel is um, had some deposition in the past few years, and they anticipate once the SRS is raised by the 10 feet, uh, we will have an increase in the trapping efficiency of the SRS, and we should be able to maintain the current level of protection uh, further down. Uh, for Just for trivia, because people ask level of scale of how much has been removed from that debris field. Uh, so cumulatively for, uh, to 2022, they are estimating 475 million cubic yards has come out of that uh, avalanche debris field, which is approximately 13% of the 3.8 billion cubic yards that was uh, at it when the mountain blew. That, that was, um, you know, I listened in on that yesterday and and it, uh, after talking with them in Washington, D.C., it, it, it became clear their, their focus is really flood control and, and the levees. Mm -hmm. And despite Dave's best effort to tell them about the shift in the river and the erosion on the other side, it's not really their focus. If 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 and he tried real hard, <laughs> but I, I I just once once I finally I sit there and listen. Okay, I get it. They're just looking at this is what they're looking at, and if you're looking at that, that's fine. If the other stuff. It almost is the point where if we want to deal with the other stuff. It's really on us. I mean, that's my take on it. Yes, that is the take because the congressional authority that they have is to maintain the flood protection in the levied areas. They are not do not have congressional authority to work in the other areas. And so that is why what they focus on and all the reports they give you are about level of protection, what the SRS uh, capacity is and the holding efficiency behind it. Uh, they do not um, provide protection in the areas that aren't levied because in the 80s when we went, we, the county went and lobbied for this, uh, they did not obtain that type of protections in addition. Yeah. I'm not sure how to begin. If you look at the chart, I mean, the, uh, the graph, uh, the orange line, uh, the Lexington level of protection at 2022 is up at some number. And then in 20, 2019, it's at a different number. What specifically changed to make that number, that assessment change? So every year when they have money, the Corps goes out and they uh, survey the channel bottom at specific cross sections. They collect that data, they add it to their river model, 
and they run different storm frequencies through it to determine what elevation the river reaches at specific storm events through the river. And in addition to updating the channel cross-section, they take the flow data that is collected across the river here at the Hall of Justice. There's a flow monitor in Castle Rock, and there's one um, on the Toodle River Tower Road. So they there's this model that they run, and then they, and it's different than when I used to do this. They now do a Monte Cristo. Uh, Monte Carlo? Monte Carlo, sorry. I was hungry, I guess. Uh, Monte Carlo simulation uh, to run the probabilities of different storms and what our return frequency looks like. And precipitation data is also thrown into that mix. Yeah, the re you know, we've suffered the last 15 years or maybe even 20 now, the climate change models. Mm -hmm. And they've all been proven to be specious. And I, if you told me that a level of protection had structure to it, I, I asked you the question I asked you because you really should expect it to be flat. In the absence of something mechanically changing, it should be flat. And uh, so I'm looking at this and I suspect that there's nothing for us to really learn from this. Just my gut feeling. Do you want a different answer? Just hand me the model. I'll make sure you get a different answer. Yes, models can be done that way. I've done that before. Uh, yes, and I, I have seen it done myself. Um, I used to do stormwater, and I used to be the person who could look at a model run when somebody handed it to me and go, you changed your um, one of the early pieces of data that you put in there, your initial time, and that can change your whole flow model of when your peak is and what the volume is. And it... it and these models are a black box now. People, you put in data and you get out an answer. So the people interpreting it need to be people who use it a lot and understand how you can manipulate the numbers. Uh, so I know that they add data every year, uh, level, you know, flow levels that they record at the stations and the cross sections. Yeah. So I imagine both of those inputs will help change that. Um, you notice uh, Longview and Kelso has not changed for a long time. They, they're at that 500 year and above return probability, and they don't check any higher than that 500 year return period. So, so uh, just a cute comment. You can, you can, if you plot everything on a log log scale, things really, really straighten out. Yes. Uh, but is there anything for us to do with this kind of data? It, it all depends on what, how you want to move forward. I mean, this data tells us that the Army Corps is um, doing what Congress has directed them to do. Um, they have the level of protection. They are raising the crest, which is based on their uh, modified, no, that modified's not supplemental environmental impact station, uh, statement for the 35-year plan of when they're, spo they're supposed to do this data uh, collection, when they see that this downward trend is occurring in the data. So they based it on trends that it's approaching it. We should raise the SRS. We should be looking at a grade building structures behind it. And if it continues on that downward, then we should potentially look at dredging. When I the, one, at the one um, problem with the data, which I, you probably can agree, is there is no correlation with rainfall. And if you have a very heavy rainfall season, the flow is going to be higher. And that's that's just natural. Not every season is the same amount of rain falling. So um, we don't have that. Uh, so we don't know if the fluctuation so something to do with additional rainfall or that may be one of the anomalies that would that would Re reduce the flood protection. 
I guess, reduce. And, and that is one of the things they discuss in this um, longer report, and they dis discussed yesterday about how we have been having below average precipitation, but we've had some higher snow levels and snowpack. Um, they talk about uh, snow, snow water equivalent that's up in the hills and the flows. So they do look at that data when they're building these models. Yeah. The other thing this chart does point out is that they haven't been monitoring every year. That is correct. And they acknowledge uh, the that. squares represent each of the years. Some years they skipped. And of course, the funding was not available yes. for those years. And uh, um, and I can't remember why they didn't why they didn't um, measure in uh, 2021, because I thought the funding had been restored, but there's no there's no square for that year. I believe, yeah, I, I don't remember why. I think it ended up being too late in the season that they didn't get it out early enough. It's, I can't remember if why beyond that they wouldn't have done it in 21, because we have been lobbying and paying for some of these monitorings. So, so the other thing, if I, again, have to rely on faulty memory, um, the lifts that have they have they had planned for last year and they got delayed will be next year. Um, that's lift number two. They've done one lift already. They had the original, and I think it was done in around 2012. That's, and you'll see there's yes. a little bit of an impact. Yes. And and then then uh, it's deteriorated again. And then they're getting ready to do the 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 next lift. And then there's one more lift. Mm -hmm. um, before they're theoretically done with their modeling for um, 2034. 20, 20, yes, but the authority doesn't go away. That's just how far the modeling has gone. Yes. So I'd like to offer that the, certainly the the oscillate or the bound, the uh, non straight line is just total poppycock. It, it, you, 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 the statistics for the real world are you, you can't track it and get a useful answer out of it. So I, I, I this kind of stuff tends to mis, misguide people, I think. So I would also think that we should have, uh, because it's statistical, you really should have error bars on there of some kind. And I'm not even sure the first moment is the one you'd be looking at. Maybe the second moment would tip you off that something might be happening. But it's it, it, there's so many variables in the system that. Uh, so I know some of their other diagrams do show bands of probability. I I, I think they tried to pick a discrete point because not everybody has taken statistics and I, I, you know i flipped the coin a perfectly uh, fair coin eight times and it came out heads i know on the ninth time it's going to come out tails right <laughs> and that's what i'm seeing here anyway. uh, yeah for us it's it's I, I i think it's pretty clear to me that dredging is something should be done yeah uh, totally bank agree. stabilization is something should be done this other stuff here is to entertain someone it's like uh i sat at a meeting once at exit 21 and uh this is several years ago now and we had to do a a traffic study there to see if there was a problem and i like no i i did the first time i came into the county yet some uh, <laughs> 18 years ago i knew there was a problem there but we got to pay someone a quarter of a million dollars to tell us there's a problem there yeah that's what well, this reminds me of and i i agree with you Arne. i i think uh but i also need to realize that if we're going to do something with the banks and and if you ever think we're ever going to get a machine in there, it's going to have to be something that that we do. I Army Corps is not going to do it through this this report. It's it's not. They're just con concerned about will the dike hold the water. <laughs> they're not as concerned. Well, the river's over here now. I think it's good to tell them, and it's taking this stuff over here now. And they go, well, that's a shame. But we we're going to have to figure out how to fix it. 
and we don't want them we don't want the core to be a block if we have to do it yeah. make sure they they collaborate with us on it they don't have to do it but don't stop us either so yeah. that's where the so, collaborative so is i think that really important. that's our role is to keep communicating that that if we're going to take this on you need to you need to not stand in the way at times when we need help you know so don't misunderstand me i think this I, I, I do appreciate this. Yeah. And they worked them over pretty hard yesterday. <laughs> yeah, go ahead, Dave. Make sure the green light's on, okay? It appears to be. Just, uh, again, I agree with what Susan has, has described to you. Uh, a couple things I would clarify. Dave, if you sit down, the audience can actually see your face. <laughs> <laughs> There we go. So is uh, one of the reasons you see the difference moving along the river is you have, uh, as you know, where the heavier stuff that comes out of the pool hits the slow moving pellets and the heavier stuff that settles out. As it moves down the stream and it moves specifically into the rocky point area where it's restricted, it stops and mounts. And that's where Lexington has ebb and flow at its level of protection because there's more sediment that ends up there. Or hasn't done anything about that. It just works its way through sometimes, sometimes it doesn't. You can look at that by looking at the sandbars and see the vegetation lines and how long they've been there. But I would also add that what you really are doing is uh, their, their, their core mission, like Susan has said, is level of protection on the certified levels. It has nothing to do with the Delamita Valley. In fact, that whole Delamita Valley is a flood. That, that, that's not their mission. So when you think all the infrastructure that is affected, that's what happens. That, that's that's okay. that's not that's okay with them, but that is not what they're concerned with. In fact, they get flood on the other side of the levee, and as long as that levee stays still, that's certified levee. That's okay. I say that sounds kind of sarcastic, but the, but the truth is, is that if they if we are not watching on the upstream side of the levee, those that those those river as it goes back and forth, they are going to cut through on the back side of some of these levees. The other issue that you talk about, what can we do? Was really a good question because there is something we can do. We need to go to we need to talk to the federal de federal delegation because at the time that this was established, the flood level was the main and only thing that we were concerned about. But as we've seen, you know, there have been very severe consequences because of the sediment in the river. Think about how much money longer it's meant to go to a different water source. Why? Because of the sediment in that river. Think what Kelso is going through because of the rain system is not affected in our our um, our sewer outfall is buried by three feet, and what happened is after the mountain river that we sat on the floor, and we were able to put it back in in 1996. We raised it two and a half feet, and it's now covered by eight feet. That's not their concern either. However, it is very concerning to the to the federal uh, to the state uh, uh, department of ecology because we don't get our mixing zone in the river. Anymore. So these things are an area, if you will, and you got to ask how many are going to die before we do something. So what we really need to be doing is talking back to the federal delegation, saying, "Listen, there's other things than the than the level, the flood level of the certified levees that we need to be considered. We need to be considering why why bank stabilization is good. It's a symptom of what else is going on, and the uh, we need to, to take that back and show them that that the other things need to be taken into consideration." The floor of that river has seen them up substantially, but they won't talk about how far or how much because that's not their concern. The only concern is what the water level is in comparison to that height of that level. So part of the answer is going back to the federal delegation and, and showing the, the the quality of life that is suffering here because of that. Now, right now, as Commissioner Dole has said, that's on us. Well, when you talk about these millions and millions and millions of dollars. That, are, that happen or are going to continue to happen as as roads wash out on the Delamere side, or homes get taken out, or our fairgrounds. We're talking about quality of life that's going to happen. So it's important that we don't that that we that we that we engage with the federal delegation to try to get something done that's going to help maintain and keep the river in the channel where it should be. Agreed. Well, Probably the 
the best agency to work through those special grants with is the Department of Agriculture, Rural Development yeah. Administration, I think. Because core, I mean, that's not the core's job to, to do the quality of life things. Yeah. But uh, it's certainly going to be FEMA's job to kind of repair the damage when it happens. And rural development should help prevent he, he, that happening. So. When I was back in February, to, to Dave's point, when uh, Mike gave me those series of, of photos, that was very, very effective because they can sit there and look and see how it's changing. And, and of course, that, that was just one area. You could have took them in, in several different areas and, 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 and done that. But yeah, that's exactly what you need to do. Yeah. So you were kind of asking if you think we should bring them in and explain it to us. I, I, I don't know that it, there's too much benefit to it unless we just want to reiterate some of the issues we think they should be looking at. Yeah. It reminds me of Aesop's table where, it, where in the end, the conclusion is if you're going to, if we're going to take care of it ourselves, expensive as it might be, it will get done. But yeah. if we count on somebody else to do it for us, it might not get done. I think we're just as effective when we, we spend time in D.C. with our lobbyists and actually sit down with the, the people that make the decisions for the people out here. Personal opinion. but So probably our lobbyists need to have this understanding of the other the other problems of mm -hmm. sewer, sewer line outfalls and water intake systems. Yeah. So. And, you know, we can't dredge anymore, can we, Dave? Fish and wildlife will kill the fish if we dredge out your... Uh... Helpful. <laughs> yep. That is all we have uh, okay. from Public Services, Public Works. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Y'all have a good day. Okay, we're heading into our two thirty. Mm -hmm. Kathy, you want to start this off or no? Yes. You need miscellaneous first. Okay, go ahead. That clock's not right so you probably do have a couple minutes three minutes okay kathy funk baxter finance director um hold on let me hand this out to you thank you yeah. oh yeah you sent out an email on this right yeah, yeah. I, I had I was supposed to bring this to your attention a couple of weeks ago, but I forgot. <laughs> so um, we have on our website, our employee website, um, through risk management, a chart that related back to COVID-19 procedures. And um, the CDC has updated their um, guidance on this, and they did that most recently uh, March 1st of 2024, um, they've made it much simpler. Um, and actually, I would like to post this flowchart on our intranet website. And I'd like to change it to actually say um, respiratory viruses guidelines. I was going to say, because this almost kind of mirror, mirrors flu. And, mm -hmm. Yes, and it's, it, that, looks, it covers that. flu. Um, I agree with that. I don't need, RSV. I don't need to just point out one thing. It's just right. how we're but we, uh, Yeah, I'd, I'd like to make it generic, um, if that's okay. And then um, we get questions on this. And so I think having the uh, flow charts good to have. and um, But it basically makes it very simple. If you're sick, stay home. Um, please stay home until your symptoms get better. Um, and you're fever free for 24 hours. And then when you return, just use uh, precautions. Um, Which is what we've told employees for years, yeah. basically. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I agree with you. I, I don't. So, yeah. I think just, I don't think you need to reference just COVID here. I think just res respiratory. Right. I'd, I'd like to change it. That. 
I made that note after I looked at it. I said it really should just say generic respiratory virus guidelines. Okay. Okay. Maybe I could I could meet with you afterwards. Okay. Yes. And it hasn't been posted yet, but I just want to make sure y'all saw it before we posted it. All right. And that's it for my miscellaneous. Did you make it within three minutes? Is it? I made it in two minutes. Okay. But you took a minute to hand it out, so. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we want to move into the. The rural, the rural public. I have I have a question for my colleagues on this before we get started. Um, you know, it's just really how how you kind of said how you want to handle it. We we looked at these a little bit last week, and and I think there was a fairly positive reaction on most of them. So I don't know what you've done in the past. If you want to take them individually, that's fine. If you want to listen to all the presentations and maybe look at them as a as a block or some exceptions, that's fine, fine too. I, I'm not sure what you've done in the past on these. I think you're the historian here. Well, we have, uh, there have been times when everybody's reiterated everything two or three times before us. Um, and we kind of scratch our head and said, okay, well, if we're already more likely to prove all the applications as submitted, we let them know ahead of time. <laughs> yeah. Then if they've got a concern or if somebody in the public has a concern about a project, they can come up and, sh and share with us. Yeah. Or if we're missing an area, that ought to be addressed. But um, we have to deal with the applications. And um, I, So we just... If, if, if we're okay to go forward, the intent would be to just have us approve a motion putting these on the consent agenda for next I I would I would like to see an individual presentation yeah. it's I mean it's called a the hearing room so that yeah. the public can see and I'm also pretty I, I I think there's a fair amount of pride in the work that has been done and let's let's have it seen from from top level down yeah I agreed I probably didn't state that well I think our intention from last week, it, I think we're intending to try and uh, at least have a motion to to move this for approval to to uh, consent agenda. But did you want to make that motion after each presentation, or just hear the presentations and do it as a group? I would do it as a group, but okay. that's... that was probably better said than the first time around. Okay. You, want, you want to explain this sheet you sent out? Because I think that's kind yes. of important. So um, you had asked me at our last um, workshop um, to look at our cash flow and what our balance is on our uh, rural public facilities fund. And really to look at it, you have to look at what where are we starting the year with cash flow. And then um, we're estimating cash to come in every month from our the sales tax and sales tax credit, um, basically. And so, and then where are outflows, the things that we're committed to already, as well as um, our debt payment um, on our, our bond. And so looking at that, if we were to award all the projects, plus the projects we already have contracts on, uh, we would end the year at December 31st, 2024, with a balance a little over $1.5 million still in reserve. That's what you were indicating last week. And we need at least like 597. It looks like we have a coverage that we like to keep. Right. We like and you'd mentioned we probably still had a million dollar surplus. So right. you're just giving us numbers to verify what you were telling right. us last week. And then I was also trying to estimate um, if we do the outflows when they possibly might happen so that we can um, have the outflows happen sporadically during the year. Like for example, maybe make some of the uh, awards in August, some of them in December, um, the disbursements to be split up. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. So just one follow-up question then. Yes. So if I look at the December, 
31 date. Um, if for some reason uh, many bad things happen and we have to carry on the obligations you'll know about at that date with what is left in reserve, will that be all right? Yes. Yes. Okay. And I was in... Um, I'm also conservative in the amount that we were showing is the monthly uh, amounts coming in. We've had some months this past year that were as high as 260,000. So I used a very conservative 241,000 for our monthly credits, sales tax credits. Well, I've been here enough and seen your numbers that I know you're you're pretty careful with these things. Okay. Okay. So I think we're ready to start. And our first presentation will be from Callowitz Public Facilities District. And I think Norm um, is here to present. Uh, well, I believe it's 147 slides. Oh. Never get through. <laughs> it's, 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 hey, Norm, it's no problem for me, but there may be some people in the audience might take exception. <laughs> oh, I have the I have a clicker. Do you want the do you want the clicker? Well, just as a side note, while we do here, 13 minutes yesterday. 13 minutes. Not when I've been sitting there. <laughs> I said, wait till I tell Paul. <laughs> Can you imagine Kelvin when I get back to him? Okay. Let's do that. Go back to the original page. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Norm Crable. I'm a public facilities manager. Is that's not on? Okay, there we go. Uh, my name is Norm Crable. I'm with the Public Facilities District. Uh, our project is the new gateway entrance project. And I would like to point out that um, since the concern uh, on funding appears to be on a fiscal year, our project, um, we would be able to get about, get by with one fourth of the project costs in 2024 and the remainder in 2025, if that helps any. Okay, the next slide. Uh, so this is a uh, view of our existing entry. It is um, problematic in that it does not align with the Kelso grid system. Uh, it's between uh, Kelso's 5th Avenue and 4th Avenues. Um, so if we go to the next slide. Uh, so this is the location of the new entrance. This is its existing condition. You can see that there's a power pole on the left side of where the drive of the where the new approach would be. Um, and there's also a guy wire over there on the right side, which is a little bit beyond um, 
the entry point, but um, there would have to be some adjustment because of the angle that it comes down there. Uh, you also see there's two buildings, uh, rather old buildings uh, in the way. Uh, so our proposed project, which we can skip to the next slide. We're going through these slides really fast. Um, it is step one of the phase one projects in our new master plan that the Cowlitz Public Facilities District um, has, has, has accomplished here recently. Um, this new gate, this new gateway would be an entry for both the Gallitz, uh Event Center, the fairgrounds, and the new proposed hotel. And then last slide. So this new entryway, this is a little bit more of a detailed uh, entry picture of the entryway. You'll see that it has um, a combined uh, walk on the west side of the uh, of the approach. So that is for pedestrians and bicycles. Uh, it ha does have a narrowed throat approach, uh, so that it's uh, one lane in and one lane out. But we are not providing parking along that uh, that drive, and then it provides access to the east, south, and west um, of the entryway. Uh, we've also provided a fairly large area for landscaping. We want to uh, beautify the entryway. And so we have a 16 and a half foot strip for uh, landscaping. And, and uh, we would intend to uh, try to create as, uh, as an attractive of an entryway as possible. Um, this, like I said, is step one for the full phase improvements. So other improvements in the full, in the first phase um, improvements that we have planned uh, would be expansion and upgrades to the existing event center. That would include upgrades to lighting uh, technology, uh, more meeting space being provided, uh, wayfinding, both off-site and on-site. So looking at improving signage to the facility, uh, to the event center, but also to the fairgrounds. Um, and then wayfinding once you are on-site so that it's clear where it is that you want to go. Uh, I did mention the fairgrounds. We are looking at expanding our entertainment opportunities on the rodeo grounds under phase one as well as completing the overnight RV parking um, in, in that same area, in, south of the, uh, of the rodeo area. Uh, the benefits of phase one, uh, these are the projected benefits from C.H. Uh, Johnson Consulting. Um, they are estimating that once phase one is complete, it will increase um, room nights, in the local area by 9,000 rooms per year. Uh, it will be an, it will represent a 45% increase in usage, which is events at the event center. Uh, it will show a revenue increase uh, in Cowlitz County of $2.7 million per year. And it will provide 69 full-time employee um, extra jobs additional jobs um and that so is, norma i yes i'm taking notes so i'm, I'm going to okay, come back and ask you for those 69 employees okay it's 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 in the uh, master plan report that you have a copy of so. i know I, I'm okay just, i'm being a bit sarcastic i apologize it, it's it's hard to to really identify those when a lot of it is um, that's my point temporary uh, employment or uh, off and on part-time employment, yeah. Wait, and when this one's done, 7th Avenue entrance goes away, is that correct? No, it doesn't go away. Doesn't the go the away. entrance on 7th Avenue will remain, but the entrance on 7th Avenue is is um, really only for the event center, right. whereas this one is, is well, aligned with 5th Avenue, 
which is only two blocks off of the, you know, the new um, light, the new the new traffic light and improvements that the city of Kelso has done. And this will be your main entrance uh, to all three of those entities, the fairgrounds, the event center, and the hotel. So this is this is meant to be the main entryway. Yeah, go ahead. So uh, the question on, uh, on the width of the access there, uh, there's no place for a bus stop or anything like that. No, no taxi stand, no, uh, and do you have accommodation for a large enough truck to bring supplies in? Well, the width of the width of the roadway is is definitely adequate for trucks. So it's a twenty six foot roadway. Those that's a full twelve foot lanes uh, with a gutter uh, adjacent to the lane. Um, and it's highway around. highway lanes are typically twelve feet in, in right. width. No, I understood there. I think but, they're eleven. But but anyhow, the uh, the, so the turnaround the, is adequate. The, the turnaround is adequate, and you can see that it's a it's a T intersection, and and the curb to the south is um, can accommodate parking. It's just the the throat that we want to prohibit parking along. Anything else? Okay. Okay. Well, I did save some time for the rest of them then. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Norm. Are you ready for the next one? Sure. So the next one on our list is City of Kalama, and this is our water plant upgrades for a request of $1 million. Hello, Commissioners. Uh, I'm Adam Smee. I'm the City Administrator for Kalama. Um, I have brought the Public Works Director, Kelly Rasmussen, with me, uh, who's much more knowledgeable about the technical aspects of, of our water treatment plant, um, in case you all have questions. Um, we, the City of Kalama, constructed our drinking water treatment plant, uh, initiated construction in 2000, completed construction and put the plant into operation in 2002. Um, over the last 20 years, uh, we've paid off the, the water treatment plant. Um, We're now looking to expand that plant by 50% uh, generation. And the, the folks two decades ago that came before us uh, thought ahead enough to make space in that facility for uh, a third filter. Uh, currently, we run two diatomaceous earth filters. Um, it's essentially like a large pool filter. Uh, we're, the, in fact, the biggest diatomaceous earth uh, water filtration plant in the state of Washington, um, partially because our drinking water comes out of the bottom of the Kalamar River uh, and is clean enough that um, the, the drinking water, uh, we can meet the compliance uh, with just a diatomaceous filter and, um, and some chlorine. Uh, our request uh, is to try to meet the um, the demand that we see coming in the future. Um, so our water system serves almost as many accounts outside the city limits uh, out in the county as inside the city limits. For those of you familiar with Kalama, uh, much of the property to the south uh, has an unpredictable aquifer. It also uh, tends to contain arsenic in certain areas. Um, so we. We have uh, years ago, uh, long before either of our times, uh, we absorbed the Cloverdale water system. Um, so we provide uh, water to both residents and then uh, also to industry and the port. Um, and so our largest water customers are actually um, the indus industries over in the port. Steelscape uh, by far uh, utilizes the, the largest amount of Kalama's drinking water. Um, so we provide fire flow as well as industrial process 
uh, and, and potable water supply. Uh, our request is for a million dollars. Uh, the total cost of the project, including design, is 3.5 million. Um, this project has been initiated uh, through the capital facilities plan uh, by the, the uh, city council in Kalama. Um, and we have begun preliminary design with our consulting engineers, uh, who are the same engineers that designed the plant originally. Um, we have, um, in an effort to be responsible and, and appeal to the sensitivities of, of our, our rate payers, um, we have done what I believe is a pretty good job uh, retaining reserves and, and building our reserve accounts. Uh, currently, our, our drinking water reserve holds about $2.4 million. Um, but we have in the next this year, plus the next five years in our capital facilities plan for drinking water alone, we have $13.5 million of projects. Um, so we're here to make the request that um, we believe the economic development dollars will uh, uh, are appropriate for, uh, for the water that, that fuels both our households as well as uh, the economy down in, in Kalama. So we're happy to answer any questions. Uh, I can expand, but I, I don't want to I don't want to repeat information that you've already seen in the application. Yeah. Go ahead. I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, when you say you're going to expand the capacity by half again as much, uh, how far into the future is that going to take you in your in the current plan? Um, I would like to say that it it that's at least a ten year horizon. Uh, some of it will depend on what kind of industry gets recruited uh, and whether that is um, in the Northport area uh, or whether that is Spencer Creek Business Park um, or, or if we see, I don't believe that residential water demand uh, will um, will utilize that, that excess capacity in the next 10 years. I, I think environmentally, we're just too constrained. Uh, I don't see our population um, going by 50% in 10 years. I've always uh, wondered about the potability. So uh, uh, the uh, steelscape plant, they're not drinking any more than anybody else, but they're using potable supply for other stuff. Right. Do you have a, a tiered cost or? <laughs> so... What's your thinking on that? Yeah. We we actually used to have a declining block rate, which was essentially the inverse of of I think where you're where you're headed with your mm -hmm. question, uh, where we uh, sold it to them at a cheaper rate because they got a, essentially a volume discount. Um, Department of Health and the Department of Ecology um, has have disincentivized that approach. They they have come out quite strongly and told us that um, they don't want us to do that. Uh, that that there should be no volume discounts because water is a scarce commodity and we should be promoting water conservation. It's it's still up to you though, isn't it? It, it, it is up to the city council. We do have a water system plan um, that has to be approved by the Department of Health. In fact, we're just getting ready to. To go out and and update ours it was last done well we submitted it in 16 they approved it in 18 um but apparently it's expired now so we need to do it again um so there's there's a certain amount of oversight um but yes uh ultimately the, the city council makes that decision on rate setting so, so one of one of the um major purposes for this particular fund is to try to, to try to stimulate the creation of jobs. Mm -hmm. And um, I know the three of us have at various times um, been pretty impressed with the job producing capabilities that the port has. And, and I, you know, we're talking about a project that'll, mm -hmm. you know, it, it increases capacity for the whole system, but really, as you've mentioned, it's, it's going to be for those future industrial uses as, as the port continues to grow. So I think it's a it, it's a it's a good fit, and, and uh, certainly um, congratulate you on on that application. Um, Thank you. Earlier, there was a little bit of concern about our cash flow and whether or not you need it all up front, or if payments can be tapered over time. Is 
Is that a possibility? That is a possibility. In fact, Director Rasmussen um, was just mentioning to me when when we were listening to the cash flow mm -hmm. uh, that a portion of this project will get constructed uh, in 25 uh, or even at the end of, of 2025. So with preliminary design, um, I believe our capital facilities plan is, has allocated 500,000 um, in 20 for the, the preliminary design and then the bulk of construction uh, the following year. So uh, I, I do think that we could receive funding uh, either in late 24 or 25. See, that makes it easier. So most likely you'll be able to work that out with Kathy as we develop the contract. And, sure. Yeah. Super. Thank you. Kudos to whoever was before you guys that actually looked at a design that was somewhat easily expandable. We don't often <laughs> do that in this, this arena. So uh, kudos to whoever they were. Yeah. Is there anything else that I can answer for you? Okay. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks. Okay. Our next um, presentation will be the Port of Woodland. And this is the Roseway Infrastructure and Utility Extension for a total request of 300000 Good afternoon, Commissioners. Um, so this is an unusual project for the Port of Woodland. Um, it has no direct benefit to the port. It is not a technically a port project. Um, we are the cat herders, <laughs> as you could uh, put it together. There is multiple properties within uh, the industrially zoned area of in Woodland. Uh, this was brought into the city limits some 35 years ago, um, has had a limited amount of infrastructure brought into the area. Uh, property owners have pretty much just continued haying or farming on the property. Uh, Columbia River Carbonates is pretty much the single most large uh, investment we've had, and that was really started in 1985. Um, recent investments and uh, discussions with property owners uh, looked at how they could coordinate the construction of the roadway so that it didn't fall on one uh, property owner. In this case, uh, Trammell Crow uh, came forward and is the leader, but there's many others that have planned developments that are in the works. Um, in this case, uh, the city was looking at putting a lot of the infrastructure costs and uh, full road investments onto that one uh, property owner. This is something that the port has heard from the city doing and placing on developers and property owners if they desire to develop their property. We felt this was a role for the port. We went to the city, talked with the city, and um, and then met with the property owners and uh, in a coordinated effort to um, get the, the infrastructure all complete as one project rather than, you know, get a little construction here, a little construction there, and the things don't map out right. So we're um, taking on that role. Um, and so right now we're just about to start the preliminary design. Uh, the biggest thing for us is finding the corners um, if you can imagine old farm grounds, it used to be, well, that rock was on the corner of our properties. Um, we found out that the deeds and uh, GIS don't match. So we're, we're trying to finalize those ones so we know exactly as the road will be extended. So this project, just to give you an overview, um, lines out uh, behind our Roseway Industrial Park. It was one of the investments that the uh, county commissioners did make when we did the Howard Way extension to bring that infrastructure. Then we brought it across the street to Roseway so that we could start that um, the um, the infrastructure uh, developments that we needed in this area. Uh, you also provided funding to the city uh, when we did the uh, when they did the um, sewer and water underneath the main line tracks. So with those two uh, intersections, that is where it's going to allow us to open up 192 acres for private industrial development. So I'm here for any questions you may have. Again, what you have described is music to my ears. That is entities working together to solve common problems. 
for whatever reason, that doesn't always happen. You know, it's, there's uh, imagined roadblocks or hurt feelings or whatever. And it, uh, we've, we've just seen some pretty, pretty tremendous gains in, in the woodland bottoms and the woodland, woodland area. Mm -hmm. I'm just, it's, it's thrilling to, to watch things come together. So yeah, it, what do they say we like it when a planet comes together. It's been a, a good process. Um, it's allowed us to outline the next four projects that we will be working on behalf with the city in partnership to ensure like for Capels um, and Gorig and Pekin, and then the Pekin intersection that crosses right before the railroad tracks. So we have everything kind of lined out in, in the years that we want to get those done. Gosh, in just a few years, we'd be ready to build that bridge across the Lewis. <laughs> <laughs> the exit 20 and a couple of other things where like I, um, I do know that there was some uh, concern of how much traffic is this going to bring to exit 21. Most of this traffic is more towards exit 22 of looking at the truck routes. We are starting to have conversations with our congressional uh, members about exit 22. Um, you know, growth is going to happen. I'm not going to say anything otherwise. That's my job is to make it grow. But what we're trying to do is have a balance between industrial and residential. Um, but we are going to be starting to work on exit 22. That was a common goal between the port and the city. Well, I know from some of the research I've done on the census figures that the Woodland area has matched the state's growth in the last decade. Callitz County only grew about 7%, but the Woodland area did was right at 14, which was the state level. Yes. So, and it's going to grow a lot more with the you residential. Can't, you can't plan enough with that kind of steady growth. I mean, it's tough to keep up with it, but it has to be done. Perfect. Okay. Thank, Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Okay. Our next one is the Port of Kalama. And this is a Spencer Creek Business Park Light Industrial Building, and they have a PowerPoint. So do we have that, Tom? And I'll try it again. <laughs> we'll see if it works. There's not. You need to, do you need to point it at any particular direction? It, it's okay. best if you aim it. Okay. it. It's best if you aim it at the clerk and then the clerk. Because <laughs> <laughs> she'll hit the button. <laughs> I feel like I'm crossing a line pointing at this. <laughs> there, oh, there we go. There we go. Thank you. Good afternoon, commissioners. Eric Yakovich. I'm the director of economic development at the Port of Kalama. Thank you for your time. And uh, thank you very much for all the support that you've provided for us in the past and that you're providing for all of us. Appreciate it very much. And what I'm here to talk about is um, one of those businesses that uh, Commissioner Weber mentioned earlier. Um, we are developing Spencer Creek Business Park at the Kalama River Road exit. And this would be the first uh, building constructed on that property to start a 70 acre development. Um, this would be a combination of light industrial with kind of a commercial look. So you see the the, the photos of this building here and, um, and it has a very um, aesthetically pleasing look as we're um, intending to do throughout our business park with, with any of the structures that go in there. So it is, uh, it's not our traditional light industrial warehouse. It is, so our traditional warehouses are 30,000 plus square feet with 10,000 square foot suites. So they're, they're dividable into 10,000 square feet. This building is 32,000 square feet, 42,000 square feet, but it's, um, got 24 to 2,500 square foot suites in it. So this is for those smaller um, businesses. We're focusing on manufacturers, hopefully, um, that we're hoping to um, get out of smaller situations, maybe out of their, their own house 
and um, to grow into larger businesses, manufacturing businesses in Cowlitz County, Kalama. Um, the project is a $13 million project, and um, we're asking for $2 million from the county. Our project is scalable, so any support you're able to give to the project, we're, we're happy to receive. So um, this, this project will create this project will create roughly 80 jobs and 50 jobs in addition for the temporary construction, which should take six to nine months. Uh, when, when we did in 2017, we conducted a feasibility study for Spencer Creek Business Park, and it noted a lack of manufacturing in, in Kalama, in the Kalama area. And so this is also to, to uh, build a manufacturing segment in, in Kalama. We're really looking as a, as a port district to support entrepreneurs. Um, we're, we're looking to help people grow from maybe that mom and pop level or even a small shop into a larger, more uh, successful business. So this, uh, this building will be um, structured that way in a way that allows the manufacturing, but also the um, retail sales component as well. And this, this type of property is lacking in the local market. It's just not available. So we expect over $4 million in sales in, in, uh, per year. Spencer Creek Business Park um, as a whole is uh, going to be a, a very vibrant uh, district of business, retail, professional, light industrial, um, all with a theme of an old mill district. And, and so we feel like this is um, really a, uh, ultimately a, um, a, a, a big job builder for Cowlitz County. This is, uh, this is just some economic impact work that we had done. This, uh, the, the park as a whole will have over $350 million statewide economic impact and uh, over 5 million in ongoing annual tax revenues, over 900 jobs, ultimately when fully built out and, uh, excuse me, over, uh, these are 2016 numbers. So roughly $200 million of economic impact just on Cowlitz County. And, um, you know, I guess the message I would give to you is that you've seen the success that the Port, Port of Kalama brings to the community in terms of our employment and our recreation. And, um, and I think you can rest assured that if you invest in us and, and that project, that you'll see results in terms of jobs. It's what we do. We bring jobs to the community and, uh, and we've shown, got a proven track record there. And I'm happy to answer any questions about the project you might have. Uh, you mentioned uh, four million of four million dollars sale per year. That's uh, what is that? That's just for the project itself. So we have, as I said, it's a forty-two thousand plus a few square feet, uh, and. It's just a projection of um, what we believe those manufacturing businesses will will sell in a year. Oh. We, do, we don't have those businesses identified at this point, so it is a projection, and it could vary, but that's, I think, a conservative estimate. And when you say manufacturing, what kind of manufacturing are you hoping to see there so it, it'll be diverse that's that's the first thing um and so the types of businesses that we have received requests for this size of space um electric scooter importer and um and assembler sales uh fishing rod manufacturer ammunition manufacturer um commercial bakery commercial food truck supplier. Um, so the, those are, that's an idea of some of the businesses that have come to us seeking this kind of space, but it's not, you know, the, those aren't on the table right now. So have, have you had interest in uh, professional offices? 
I've had a veterinarian, I've had a small medical office, I've had folks like that contact us, but nobody that has gone to the build the point of building. I think I, what what I'm finding personally, and I and I'm the one that that cites tenants, is that for those smaller businesses, there's not three years of planning for them to do. They're they're looking for an office and they're looking for it now. <laughs> and um as they grow and maybe get bigger, maybe they'll have that opportunity to plan further on the horizon. But um, the types of businesses that we're talking about just don't come ready to wait for 18 months for a building to be built. So with with the park right now being just sand, um, we have you know six to nine months of permitting and uh, and design and build, and that's a two year process. And uh, and so we're we're we believe we need to build that building, put it up to create that success, and then take you know incremental steps with the next buildings. Understood. Continuing on that, uh, do you do you have any notion about R and D type offices? We would love to have research and development. It, it it really has to be associated with a major project. You know, with some of the industry. Um, our, our hope is that with our 95 acres of heavy industrial property across the freeway, that we would have a, a research and development component associated with whatever would be the tenant there. Yeah, the quality of life here is much superior to what someone's gonna have in the Seattle area, for example. No, I mean, topographically, Seattle's really interesting, but it, it's, if you have children, you want to be here, not there. Yeah. So something we use a lot. Yeah. And, that and message. So I, I I hope you'll be able to attract uh, little startups of some kind. Absolutely. So you've got that in mind. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. And um, I think that was it. Yeah. It, it re reminds me, and I and it sounds like it's a little bit different focus when I my younger banking career is commercial banker up in Auburn. We banked a lot of small business that did support work for like a Boeing or or stuff mm -hmm. like that, and and they made a good good living in doing these type of things. But they weren't in twenty thousand square foot right deals, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah, it's the kind of thing too. I I know uh, several years ago I looked at trying to attract an avionics outfit up here, and all kinds of things fell apart, including the fact that the uh, space available near the airport was being taken up by by the, by the, by the marijuana growers. Um, so, you know, I, it's like, the, how can you compete against drug money? You can't. Uh, and so uh, I gave up on that particular effort. Uh, but I think this is the kind of thing you identified doesn't exist here for the most part. And I think it fits the, certainly with your history of performance of the port, uh, you build it and they'll come. Yeah. I think it's going to be wildly popular. Yeah. We are seeking other monies um, and uh, from CURB, uh, Department of Commerce, State Department of Commerce, and then whatever we do not get in the form of grants, the, the port has committed to cover for the construction. And I will say also to address an earlier question, um, we're able to we're able to wait for your timeline, if uh, if in fact we were to be successful, as long as you need, within reason. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you very much Thank for you. your time. Appreciate it. Yeah. Okay, and our last uh, presentation is City of Castle Rock, and it's for Exit 48 um, for Sewer Extension Project, and the request is $450,000. You should have a slide. Oh, yes, they have a slide. Thank you. There you go. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Thank you for the opportunity to present at the Exit 48 Sewer Main Extension Project to support infrastructure improvements at Exit 48 in Cass Rock. I'm Tyler Stone, 
Public Works Senior Operator for the City of Castle Rock. With me today is the Honorable Mayor of Castle Rock, Paul Hellenberg, and our Public Works Director, David Force. I can get this to work. <laughs> All right, one more, please. Thank you. This is a map showing the proposed improvements. The beginning phases of this project included approximately 6,000 feet of a six inch sewer force main starting from the Castle Rock Wastewater Treatment Facility heading east to the east side of the BNSF right of way on Huntington Avenue. What we are requesting is additional funding assistance to complete the final 1200 feet of the sewer force main to the intersection of Huntington Avenue South and Bond Road. This will be the location of the future sewer pump station. So the area is marked in red there. And next slide, please. The force main will provide sewer capacity for 500,000 gallons of sewer daily. This capacity will be necessary for development of the 67 acres of highway commercial property on the east side of the I-5 corridor exit 48. This project has other benefits as well. Not only is this project crucial for economic development on the east side of exit 48, it also has other benefits. Currently, sewer services are not available for the residents on the southeast side of Castle Rock. With this project in place, it can lead to future sewer service area expansion on the east side of I-5, which includes residential growth opportunities for the city and the county. This map is showing the properties adjacent to I-5 at exit 48. This shows that there are 50.6 acres zoned as highway commercial in the city and 16.7 acres in the county that are unzoned urban areas for a total of 67 acres. The 67 acres on the east side of exit 48 are extremely valuable. With future sewer utilities, this undeveloped land can easily turn into a job generating powerhouse with a close access to I-5. The geographic location has huge benefits with being centrally located between Olympia and Portland and being reasonably priced for the value of the properties. This slide is showing an example of one of the future developments being proposed in the area. The property owner has come to the city with interest in developing, but without having sewer services in the area, this project has become infeasible. When the sewer infrastructure is placed, we will start seeing developments like this one start to take action. This one in particular, including a truck stop, hotel, restaurant, and other potential amenities, adding an estimated 70 jobs. With information we received from EDC Director Ted Sprague and the research done in the Clark County and surrounding areas, the 67 acres will create an estimated 900 new highway commercial jobs. Based on these projections, the number is conservative. This will include approximately 290 to 390 family wage jobs and 440 secondary or indirect jobs. With this includes opportunities for new businesses, expanding businesses, and existing businesses that may want to relocate to this area. Here's a little history of the project. Before the year 2020, the city had installed 2,600 feet of six inch sewer force main, starting from the Castle Rock wastewater treatment facility and ending near the Lions Pride Park on Huntington Avenue South. Then in 2020, with the help of Cowlitz County Rural Development Funds, installed another 2,400 feet. In this phase, the city used the $160,000 from the county and not only extended the sewer main, but also with the use of city labor and in partnership with Cascade Natural Gas, extended a four inch gas main from the Lions Pride Park to the entrance of the landing of the Cowlitz development, which is just west of the BNSF railroad. 
This $317,000 project was completed with only $160,000 using city labor and resources for a savings of $157,000. The latest phase of this project has been in 2024 with the additional 1,000 feet that extended the force main through BNSF right of way and up to the last phase of exit 48 sewer main project. This project was paid for by funds secured by the city. The cost breakdown on this project up to this point, the city has added $1,794,000 worth of value to this project. We are anticipating the final phase of the project to be $450,000, which is 21% of the project. This cost is due to the requirements of washtop and complexity of working in the washtop right away. The city has already completed the preliminary work in preparation to get this project going, including the designs and washtop permitting, which will help get this project done in a timely manner. The city has historically been successful building partnerships and relationships. We have proven we can handle several funding sources at a time. This has been a necessity for the work we have accomplished. With motivated leadership, the city has been proficient in getting maximum production out of every funding dollar we have spent. Regional support we've had on this project includes Cowlitz County Economic Development Committee, Cowlitz Wakayakum Council of Governments, Cass Rock City Council, and the Cowlitz County Commissioners through the Rural Development Funds in the past, as you have all seen the value in this project with your support. Without your support, the county, this project will be delayed. Although the county would show support in funding this project, we can get this completed in the fall of 2024. We hope we can continue this great partnership. <coughs> Excuse me. And now at this time, I wanna first thank you for your consideration of this project. And I wanna open it up for any questions you may have. I, I don't really have any questions. I've, I've, I've watched some of the, the work that's gone out, on out there and, and uh, uh, it, it always, it always seems like it it's on time and it and it works and, and I I lament this stuff only because of you know I I like the little community but and I know it grows and yeah. and but that's only a selfish view. <laughs> <laughs> I know the community is doing well. I don't think there's any vacant buildings downtown. I think they all use and then I saw what's happened at where the space age is and it's just blown me away how how fast that has grown and and I can imagine you're going to see the same type of stuff I mean these communities like Cast Rock and Flamma and stuff people it's quality of life and they're they're going there I don't have a pertinent question I have a question of curiosity it has nothing to do with it has to do with pressurizing the sewer line how do you do that uh, with the sewer pump station, we plan on putting one at the intersection of Huntington Avenue and Bond Road. Got it. Okay, so if I flush the toilet, I don't have to be concerned it's going to come back at me. <laughs> no. Nope, you don't. <laughs> you know, I... <laughs> That's the other switch. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Okay, thank you. Thank and you. Uh, uh, so you have a... You have a station there where that pump station is that is a collector there then yes it is and from there to home it's a uh, to, to, it'll be a gravity line to the homes, and yeah. uh what do you do with the biosolids uh we land apply yeah but you part we land apply we have a biosolids application site So, but you, you, but you have to after after yeah we after it goes to our wastewater treatment facility, right? We uh, we land apply to. That's uh, the part I'm not hearing. Well, I, I've got hearing aids in, but you're still so, sorry. You're you're, you're, apply, you're applying it to some land. We we do yes. Yeah. Okay. Oh, so you take care of it yourself. You don't Correct. you don't ship it out or anything. Nope. That's interesting. Yeah. Thanks for it. 
We put it on the next photo. <laughs> Is that true? <laughs> cool. As you know, the red puddles are emerged, don't have any organic, hydroorganic, no erosion. Um, it's just, it will make this park area. How long have you been doing that? Uh, since the 90s. Wow. Pretty good, David. Yeah, good. Any other questions? No. Great. Thank you. Good proposal. Thank you. So in in summation, we have a, a total of 4.2 2 million five hundred thousand of request um, for use from the rural public facilities funds. And as you showed us earlier, we have the the funds there, and and uh, my colleague Commissioner Mortensen says we like to see, pro and I totally agree with him. See projects that will breed uh, more activity in the in the future, or more economic activity in the future. And I think all of these fit that bill. Would you like a motion, Mr. Chairman? I would thank you. Mr. Chairman, I move that we approve all of the grant requests that have been presented here today for a total sum of four million. Four million two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Yeah, that number. Okay. And would your motion also um, provide direction for Kathy to negotiate timed payments, or should they all be paid at once? I, I don't think it needs to be in the motion, but no, I. I that's that's contract negotiation after that, and it's I think him. that's completely yeah. up to discussion. But uh, I'll be glad okay. to add that if you'd like. So added. Okay. okay. Do we have a motion to approve? Any questions? I think we need to add a line to Cast Rock. The mayor needs to get in a barrel. At Bull Mania. <laughs> <laughs> no, we won't do that. <laughs> okay. Second that. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I see no no questions. No hands raised. Call for a vote. Those in favor? Aye. Aye. Also vote aye. Thank you all for the presentation and for the work in your communities. We appreciate it. Anything else? We're good. I have nothing else. Okay. Any miscellaneous before we adjourn this thing? Okay, we are adjourned.